Good evening. Attempting to keep her children steadfast at the difficult time of fasting during Lent, the period we are now inside of in the ecclesiastic year, the Church mobilizes a variety of historical events and figures to come to the spiritual aid of the faithful. The first Sunday of Lent, Sunday of Orthodoxy, reminds the faithful of the Church's glory and grandeur and the restoration of the icons. During this period, we are presented with the figures of St. Gregory Palamas, the great Archbishop of Thessaloniki, on the second Sunday of Lent, and then on the fourth Sunday, St. John, who wrote the Climax, the prelude to the way of monasticism. And finally, on the fifth Sunday, we commemorate Mary of Egypt, whose life and choice to leave her sinful ways and to go inside the desert are aimed at awakening even the most hardened sinners and to lead them to repentance. For the third Sunday of Lent, which is coming up this week, precisely the midpoint of the Lenten struggle inside the Stadium of Virtues, the Church gives us the Sunday of the Adoration of the Cross. It is called the Sunday of the Adoration of the Cross because at the Vigil or Orthros of this day, after the Great Oxology, the Cross is taken in a modest procession to the center of the Church and remains there for the rest of the week, so at the end of each service during the week, there is a prostration in front of the cross. This third Sunday of Lent presents us the dreadful instrument of Roman death, which also became the instrument and vehicle of salvation for humankind. On this day, the Church also presents the crucified Christ, as if to say, Look at him who was crucified for us, how difficult is your endeavor of fasting compared to what he, Christ, endured? With a life-giving cross, Christ sweetens the bitterness we feel from fasting, strengthens us on our journey in the desert until we reach the spiritual Jerusalem with his resurrection. Since the cross is called the tree of life and this tree was planted in paradise, therefore the Holy Father's placed its celebration and adoration in the middle of Lent, to remind us of Adam's bliss as well as his fall from it, to remind us also that with our participation in this tree, we no longer die, but are made alive. In fact, inside this midpoint of Lent, in a wider period characterized by serious and somber hymnologic atmosphere, illustrating tears and repentance, the Church celebrates, the Church is joyous, this is clear in the choice of the musical modes used to present the logos of the hymns on this Sunday. The choice of the celebrational third mode for the Vesperal Doxastichon of the Stichira is informative.
This toxasticon was composed for the vesperal portion of the pre-feastal day of the elevation of the cross on the 13th of September. As this service is rarely presented outside the monastic communities, the Holy Fathers decided to repurpose it for the Vespers of the third Sunday of Lent, appropriately so. The words of the Doxasticon are deeply theologic. The hymn portrays Christ as the willing sacrificial lamb who on his own dipped his fingers into his own blood, using the instrument of the cross to transfer salvation to us through this blood, his blood that grants eternal life. The macabre language used by the hymnographer in this Doxasticon was not by accident. Consider, however, that the macabre is also a medicine. Christ's act to dip his fingers into his own blood, using the instrument of the cross, as painful as it is portrayed, actually brings about and offers a cure. Indeed, many medical procedures, especially the surgical, are macabre and bloody, but end up being life-saving. The hymnographer writes, O Christ our God, you accepted your voluntary crucifixion, for the general resurrection of the human race. And using the cross as a pen, you dipped your fingers in the red ink of your blood, and you signed our imperial pardon as king, and thus showed mercy on humanity. Do not forsake us, who once again are in danger of being estranged from you. You alone are long-suffering. Therefore, take pity on your people in distress, and rise up and fight those who fight us, for you are the Almighty Lord." And the macabre is transformed into a feastal rejoicing. Why is it? For no other reason than that the instrument of death, a perversion of nature, the perverse use of one of God's natural creations, a tree, was transformed by Christ to be an instrument of salvation. Christ returns the tree to its natural use, its provision of life to nature through its roots, and leaves and its provision of life to humankind. The establishment of the celebration of the Holy Cross during the third Sunday of Lent has a number of different reasons. According to one point of view, it has to do with the actual historical fact of its physical finding by St. Helen. This event is celebrated, as in the case of the universal elevation of the cross on the 14th of September, by the Church on March 6 of each year. According to the Synaxarion of March 6, on the same day the finding of the Holy Cross, and on the same day, that is in March, the memory of the finding of the Holy Cross under the blessing of Helen, on this day memory of the finding of the Holy Nails. Of course, this holiday could not be celebrated with splendor and solemnity on any day of the Great Lent due to its special character. Hence, it was probably moved to the Sunday in the middle of Lent, due to the 51st canon of the Synod of Laodicea, which forbade the observance of holidays other than Saturday and Sunday. Another possible reason for the celebration is considered the prostration in front of the Holy Cross during the Orthros of Holy Friday, earlier in Jerusalem and later in Constantinople. The entry of Megalinaria into the Orthros of Holy Friday replaced all the rites, including the prostration in front of the Holy Cross. A different approach on the subject is presented by the monk-priest Makarios of Simonopetra Monastery. He proposes that the Feast of the Adoration of the Cross is related to the completion of a trinity of feasts of the Holy Cross. Clearly, the other two feasts have to do with a universal elevation on September 14th and the progress of the Holy Cross on the 1st of August. Makarios cites as evidence the titling of the day as the Feast of the Third Prostration of the Cross, which is witnessed in a Jerusalem manuscript of the 13th century. He proposes that this third pilgrimage was instituted by the transfer of a piece of the Holy Cross from Jerusalem to Apamia, following a request by the local bishop Alfios to his fellow Archbishop of Jerusalem. This case is also examined by the scholar Evangelos Theodoru, who places it around the 6th century in the times of Emperor Justin I, between 518 to 527 AD, or Justin II, between 565 to 578 AD. Yet another possible cause for the establishment of the feast can also be considered the restoration of the Holy Cross 
by Emperor Heraclius in Jerusalem on the 21st of March, 630 AD, after a victory against the Persians and its recovery. After a series of multi-year efforts and victorious battles, Heraclius, amidst the cheers of the crowd, repeats the ceremony that took place when the Holy Cross was first found by Helen. The date of this celebrational event, inside the period of the Great Lent, can be considered as a reason for its celebration on the third Sunday of Lent. In any case, the mention of the feast in a homily by Patriarch Germanos places its establishment at least around 715 to 730 AD, remaining until the 12th to the 13th century as a feast specifically celebrated inside the Church of St. Sophia in Constantinople. Interestingly, it was directed to be celebrated on a Wednesday during the middle of Lent. <laughs> This is a festival day. At the awakening of Christ, death has fled away. The light of life has dawned. Adam has risen and dances for joy. Therefore, let us cry aloud and sing a song of victory. The canon of the Adoration of the Holy Cross was composed by the 8th century hymnographer Theodore of Studium. The canon of the feast is interesting for a number of reasons. The theme of the cross which dominates the third Sunday of Lent's hymnology is presented not in the context of suffering, but of victory and joy. Even more, the canon of this Sunday is borrowed almost word for word, and certainly musical, from the Paschal Canon, paraphrasing many if not all of the troparia of that canon. Indeed, 
This is a prime example of what is referred to as a Stavro Anastasimos, a cross-resurrectional canon. Apart from its content, which is cross-resurrectional, and demonstrating the relevance and relation of the Holy Cross to the three-day victory of Christ through it, even the external, morphological characteristics of the words and language used in the canon prepare us for the joyous event of the resurrection. The canon in question has been modeled on the troparia that constitute the canon of Pascha, musically in first mode, and where the irmi are borrowed almost word by word from the irmi of the Paschal canon. The announcement of the resurrection of the Lord surrounds the entire canon, but always in connection with the adoration of the Holy Cross. I will now present some interesting and inspiring troparia from this wonderful canon, a poem by Theodore of Studium. In the Irmos of Ode 4, the hymnographer is inspired by the corresponding fourth biblical ode, a hymn of the prophet Habakkuk, when he predicted the incarnation of the Lord, which begins as follows, Lord, I listened to your voice and was afraid. Lord, I have understood your works and exhibited them. In turn, the hymnographer, in a wonderful poetic conception, addressing the Lord, says that when the great luminary, the sun, faced him on the cross, seized with terror, he gathered and hid his rays, and all creation sang with fear for his long suffering, while the earth was filled with his comfort. In this way, it is declared that the whole of creation, heaven and earth, co-participated with its creator in his crucifixion. In the third troparion of Ode 8, the cross is portrayed as the fourfold world of the brightness of Christ's resurrection, showing the dawns through yourself, and in advance of Christ's passion with your brightness, the fourfold world, which has four edges. Again, the cross, the former instrument of death, is presented by the hymnographer as a thrice joy-generating wood, and as a bright sign that heralds the resurrection. The fifth troparion of Ode 9 presents an analogy between the wood of knowledge, which was the cause of the fall of the first created, and the wood of life, the crucified Lord, who through his sacrifice on the cross resurrects Adam and all his descendants, the whole human race, and bestows upon them eternal life. Please.
Tonight we present one more cantor of old time, Dimitrios Maguris. A distinguished Caliphanes Protopsaltis, he was born in the Ipsomathia district of Constantinople in 1913. He studied at the schools of Agios Giorgios of Kiparisa and Agios Constantinos of Ipsomathia. He continued at Makrochori High School and graduated in 1932 from the Pera District Community High School. He began his chanting service at a very young age with his first teacher in the art of singing being Elias Ioannidis, his cousin, and Protopsaltis of the Church of St. George Kiparisa, with whom he sings in this and many other neighboring churches in the Ipsomathia District. As a young man, he is hired as a domesticos and then as a Lambadarios at the Church of St. Minas in Ipsomathia by the late Theodosios Okumusoglu, where he sang until 1933 to then continue cultivating his singing art at the Church of the Entrance of the Theotokos in the Pera district next to the great cantor teacher Nikolaos Belas, serving as his domesticos. Then he served for one year, 1938 to 1939, as the Domesticos of the Archon Protopsaltis of the Great Church of Christ, Constantinos Pringos, at the Patriarchal Church of St. George. Thereafter, in 1939, he assumes the service of the Domesticos to the renowned Ioannis Palasis at the Church of St. Nikolaos at the Galata District. In 1941, he becomes Protopsaltis at the Church of the Savior Christ at the Galata, and then in 1953, he becomes the Protopsaltis of the Church of the Holy Trinity at the Stavrodromi neighborhood of the Pera district. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
In 1965, he arrives in Greece and settles at Iraklion Crete, where he was appointed Protopsaltis of the Church of St. Titos at the request of the then Metropolitan of Crete, Evgenios. He departs Crete in 1967, arriving in Athens and assuming the service of Protopsaltis at the Church of Panagia in the Kesariani municipality, where he sang until 1976. At that time, he was called to the Metropolitan Church of Kesariani, St. Nicholas, where he served as its Protopsaltis and choir master for five years, at which time, in 1981, he retired from active service. Dimitrios Maguris was one of the few Psalte of all time who had managed to complete 60 consecutive years of active service at the Analoyon, and throughout his ministry, he did not cease to cultivate and teach young people the art of chanting and the particular style of the Constantinopolitan masters, of which he is considered one of the few real representatives and expressors. He was indeed a great cantor and teacher of the art of chanting, a worthy successor of the great cantors of his birthplace, who with the seriousness and responsiveness of his chanting and his characteristic modest style, taught and defined an inspirational, authentic path, followed by many of his contemporary, legendary cantors of all time.
Dear friends, among the questions we received in the last month, we would like to address the following. The first, why are the Lenten compunction at Sunday Vesperal Prochimena referred to as Great Prochimena? And second, is the hymn Gladsome Light, Fossilaron, chanted or is it read during the Lenten Vesperal services? To respond to the first question on the Prochimena, the word Prochimenon denotes a psalm verse which is sung or read in the worship of the church before the reading of a main text. There are five general categories of prokimena. First, the daily prokimena sung at the daily Vesper services, belonging to the weekly liturgical cycle and, therefore, being found in the Orologion. There are seven such prokimena, one for each of the days of the week, and they alternate cyclically in the daily Vesper services. Second, the great prokimena. These are the two that are panegyric in content and sung at the great dominical feasts, that is, who is so great a God, and our God in heaven and on earth, and another two compunctionate prochimena that are sung during Lent, do not turn away your face, and you have given an inheritance. Third, the prochimena prefacing epistle readings. Fourth, the prochimena prefacing gospel readings, and fifth, the Prochimena preceding readings from the Old Testament during the Lenten period. The reason why the Prochimena sung at the Vespers of certain Dominical feast days and during the Compunction at Sunday Vespers are referred to as great is threefold. First, they precede texts at the great Dominical feasts of the Nativity of Christ, St. Thomas Sunday, and Pentecost, as well as at Epiphany, the Ascension, the Transfiguration, and the elevation of the Holy Cross. That these feasts are also referred to as great feasts confers the same description to these prochimena. Second, these great prochimena are sung more than four times and are prefaced by four or more other psalmic verses unlike the other prochimena in the ecclesiastic cycle, which are sung only once, repeated three times, and with only one psalmic verse prior to the last repetition. And third, the changing of the vestment of the holy altar table to one of another color at the services where the great prochimena are sung during the Lenten period. And at that exact point in the service, this requires some time by the clergy to complete. Thus, the lengthier melody and the multiple repetitions confers to these prochimena the designation of great prochimena. To respond to the second question on the chanting or not of the hymn Gladsome Light during Lenten Vespers, all of the major typica direct this hymn to be always sung at all Vespers, including those of the Lenten period. This is supported by the words in the hymn, Worthy it is at all times to praise you in joyful voices, which refers to singing voices. Further support that this hymn historically was and should be sung is found in the Tipicon of the Monastery of St. Sabas at Jerusalem, the Tipicon of Messina, the Tipicon of the Monastery of Dionysios, the Great Efcholoion in early 15th century versions and later, as well as scholarly work by Dmitrievsky and Trembelas. While this is the Tipicon noted rule, there are many churches that now opt to read the prayer instead, to be more in line with, perhaps, the solemn nature of the Lenten Vesperal services. The answer lies in the discretion of the local bishop and his instruction to the churches under his aegis. Dear friends, in older times and centuries when the monasteries in the old lands of our ancestors were full of monks, athletes, and ascetics, most left the monastic community at the beginning of the Triodion period to go deep inside the forests, high on the mountains, or away from people into the desert. There they lived inside caves, shelters, sand barriers, in strict fast, awakening, spiritual restraint, reading, praying, singing. And then on Lazarus Saturday as the Lent was coming to an end, one by one, they began their return to the monastic community. As they returned en route or immediately close to the monastery entrance, they came into contact with their returning brothers and sisters. 
they joyfully embraced and rejoiced that, yet for another year, they survived their self-imposed exile into the wilderness and returned more enlightened, spiritually stronger, closer to God. Returning as Olympian victors from the struggle inside the Stadium of Virtues. As the Church welcomes them back, beginning on Lazarus Sunday and Palm Sunday, the first hymn of the Palm Sunday Feast is not related to the events that happen in Jerusalem, but instead refers to the return of the brothers and sisters. Today the grace of the Holy Spirit has brought us together, and all of us take up your cross and say to you, Blessed are you, the one who is coming in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. In fact, in the monasteries, this hymn is sung not once, but five times at the Vespers, and then once more at the midpoint of the Matins, perhaps for those who arrived late. Friends, with this podcast, we complete an entire year of offerings that we hope have been educational, helpful, and possibly spiritually renewing. The new year of podcasts will maintain this level and will open up avenues of insight that today remain largely unexplored or underappreciated. I would like to thank my colleagues at the School of Byzantine Music of our Archdiocese, Archon music teacher of our Archdiocese, George Theodoridis, Reverend Father Panayotis Steele, and George Rallis for their support and their insights. Most importantly, I would like to thank His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros for his agape of everything traditional in the realm of Byzantine music and hymnology through his directive and action to reimagine the school of Byzantine music of the Archdiocese and his admonition to raise the level of knowledge of this unique art to not only practicing cantors, but to the lady as well. I am particularly thankful to Christ God, who has brought a younger generation to the school to learn in the most authentic tradition and to the depth that is unparalleled elsewhere. We pray that those of you interested to learn this art, reach out to the school and learn about it and consider joining. We pray at the very least that you continue to follow these podcasts and to let your friends and colleagues know about them. Last, I am thankful to Christ God, who, despite our human weaknesses, blessed us this year through the Holy Spirit in bringing you and us together inside these podcasts as we proclaim to him, Blessed are you, the one who is coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Yeah.